Mm -hmm. Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to five player game, Dawn of Ulos, designed by Jason Lentz and published by Thunderworks Games, who helped sponsor this video. In the world of Ulos, goblins, elves, frog kin, and a host of other mortals do battle. As one of the overseeing gods, it'd be of no real interest to you, except the other gods are placing wagers on who will win, and who can resist a good wager, especially if you might be able to influence the outcome. There are bets to make and favors to win, so join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, randomly arrange these six interlocking boards into a two by three map. This will allow you to have different layouts when you play, and when you're done, it might look something like this. The map is made up of various types of terrain that we'll learn about later, but for now, note these spaces known as wastelands. The tiles with this back are known as the rift tiles, and you'll mix them face down and then randomly place one onto each wasteland space of the map. It'll look like this when you're done, and then you return any leftover rift tiles unseen back to the box. These are the development tiles, which you shuffle into a face down supply nearby, along with these favor tokens, which I'm organizing into some trays that I have. Each person now takes any one of the god player mats, along with one of these rift tile references. We'll assume we have three players in this video, returning any leftovers back to the box. The gods in the game all work the same way, but each have their own backstory, and their front side serves as a player aid. Each player now collects a total of 25 favor from the supply, and draws three development tiles. You can always examine your own tiles at any time during the game, but keep them a secret from the other players. The cards with this back make up the various factions of the game, which you can distinguish by their fronts. Each faction is made up of 16 matching cards, and you'll organize these into their own decks, like I've done here. You then pick five for your game in any combination you like. However, elves, flares, and ogres are known as conflict factions, and you should never put any more than two of these factions in your game at the same time. For your first game, they recommend going with the goblins, orcs, rat folks, satyr, and sheki. But since I want to give you an example of a conflict faction, we'll replace the sheki with the flares. Each faction has a camp marker with a figure matching the artwork on its cards. Beside each deck, set the matching camp marker, returning any extras back to the box. If you're using the orc faction in your game, also set these pillage tokens by their deck. Now find these strength markers for the factions in your game, returning any extras back to the box. Each of these will have a legendary side which shows a crown, but they always begin the game crown side down. Now place this power board nearby and set the strength markers onto this lost space of the track here. Now determine who woke up earliest today and give them this start player marker. Or you can just choose someone randomly. And that's the setup. In Dawn of Ulos, you and the other players will be playing tiles to the map, potentially strengthening or weakening the factions, while trying to collect the cards for the factions you think will become the most powerful, but also trading in cards for points before those related factions weaken. Essentially, your alliance to the factions will shift based on which ones you think will benefit you the most in the moment, and perhaps later in the game. You may be a god, but you're a fickle one. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the first player and going clockwise around and around the table. And on your turn, you'll perform three steps, starting with placing a tile. Here you pick one of your development tiles and add it to the map. You can set the tile anywhere you like, as long as the terrain types directly underneath of it exactly match the terrain types shown on the tile itself. And you'll find deserts, fields, forests, water, and mountains. Here we have a mountain and field on this tile, so it could be placed in this position as an example, or perhaps over here or here. We'll see later that these rift tiles can be removed from the board, leaving a wasteland hex exposed underneath, and any type of terrain can be placed on top of a wasteland space. So for example, we could instead place this one here. And just so it's clear, new tiles that get added don't have to be placed adjacent to other tiles already on the board. You really can place them anywhere as long as the terrain underneath matches. Now that said, you can't place a tile so that it hangs off the map or overlaps another tile, including rifts. You also can't cover water terrain either, since none of the tiles show water terrain on them. Now, during the game, as more tiles get added to the board, there are a couple of key concepts you'll want to understand. 
First of all, any group of one or more connected tiles on the board are known as a territory. So we have a territory here and a separate one here. All areas of the map without a tile are just known as map spaces. They're not territories. We'll soon see how these faction camp markers are added to the board, but they are only placed on territories, not map spaces. And once added to a territory, all of its connected tiles are considered part of its occupied territory. Any group of one or more tiles without a faction marker are known as unoccupied territory. And a territory can have, at most, one faction camp marker on it. So again, on your turn, you add a tile from your hand to any valid spaces of the map. And in the rare case that there are no valid spaces, you just skip this step. That said, assuming you were able to place a tile, you then check to see if any events occur as a result. Your player sheet shows the steps of a turn and reminds you of the four possible events that can occur after placing a tile. And you'll resolve any that would apply. You don't have to do them in the listed order, but that can help ensure you don't skip one. So let's learn how each one works, starting with establishing a camp. All factions with a tile in this area are said to be lost, but they're looking for a territory to establish a camp on, represented by their base camp markers, which come in a variety of shapes. When an unoccupied territory is created or expanded by the placement of a tile, check to see if it has room for any one of the lost faction camp markers. If it does, the current player picks any faction that would fit and places it on those tiles. Camp markers can cover any combination of tile spaces, including rifts like these. It does not matter what type of terrain they're covering up. As soon as a faction's camp marker is added to the map, it is said to be an active faction, and the current player gains one free card from the matching faction's deck by the board. Unless the deck is empty, in which case they gain nothing. We'll learn more about the value of the cards in a moment, but just be aware, once a territory has a camp, another camp can't be added to it. New camps are only established on unoccupied territories that now have room for them. Here's another important rule to be aware of. On each player's first turn of the game, they must place a tile adjacent to a rift and positioned so that a camp can be established if that's possible. If that's not possible, they just place a tile as normal. And this rule is only enforced on each player's first turn. On future turns, they can place tiles anywhere, no matter what they did on their first turn. Otherwise, that covers establishing a camp. So now let's look at the Adjust Faction Power event. Each faction gains power from what are known as its two foundation territories shown on its base camp marker. For example, the orc gains power from deserts and mountains. Anytime a camp is established or its territory is expanded, count how many visible spaces in its territory match its foundation types. That number is its territory value. In this case, we see one mountain. So the current territory value is one. You now move that faction's token, known as its strength marker, to the space of this track, matching its current territory value shown on this row. Let's say it was later in the game, and this was the orc's territory. We can now see one, two, three, four, five visible foundation terrains on those tiles, so their strength marker should be on this five space of the track. Just keep in mind, the spaces covered by the camp marker itself are never included in that territory total. Also, when a camp is first established, if its territory has no visible spaces matching its foundation terrain, or if it has no visible terrain at all, like we see here, then it has no territory value. In that case, move its marker from lost to this zero territory space. If a faction's strength marker ever reaches or would go past what is known as the legendary space of the power track, just keep it here, but flip it to its legendary side, which will show this crown symbol. This will make that faction more valuable during final scoring, and it will remain legendary even if its strength is later reduced on this track. That covers adjusting a faction's power, so next we'll learn how to resolve the collect a rift tile event. If the current player adds a development tile so that it connects an occupied territory to a visible rift tile, they collect that tile from the board. Rift tiles will have a special power on the other side, and you can always look at the powers on your own tiles, but keep them a secret from the other players. We'll discuss rift tiles and how they're used a little later. For now, though, let's learn how the final event is resolved, initiating a conflict. This happens when a tile is placed that would connect two or more occupied territories. When this happens, you instead flip the tile face down. 
you would then immediately resolve the conflict. But I believe conflicts will make a little more sense once we know a few more of the rules. So let's continue learning about how a turn is resolved, and then we'll come back and discuss conflicts later. Aside from conflicts, we've learned every event you may have to resolve after placing a tile. And once they're complete, you move to the next step of your turn, taking an action. This is an optional step, but if you choose to take it, you'll now pick one of two possible actions to resolve. So let's learn the first one, buying cards. Here you may buy up to three cards from any combination of active factions, but for each card bought, you must spend favor you have equal to the strength of that faction, which is indicated by the value and strength icon beneath its token. So if I wanted a flare card and two orcs, I would spend three favor for the flare and five for each of the orc cards. That's a total of 13 favor, which I'd return to the supply. Now remember, you can't buy cards for lost factions, and if a deck runs out, you can't buy any more cards from that faction until some get returned, which we'll learn about later. All cards you collect go into your hand, and you can always look at your own cards, but keep them a secret from the other players. The other action you may instead complete on your turn is using an ability. To do this, first reveal any one card of an active faction from your hand. However, pay attention to the symbol in this area. Only cards with this action ability symbol can be played this way. Cards with the conflict symbol, which we see here, can only be played during a conflict. Now look at the column containing the faction token for the card you revealed, and check its current spoils value, which is represented by this symbol. You now gain that amount of favor from the supply, so in this case, we collect four. Now resolve the card's ability text here. In this case, we're told that for every two strength the orc currently has, we may add one pillage token to a visible space in any occupied territory. Checking the track, we can see that the orc's strength is currently five, so we could place up to two pillage tokens. Each tile space can have at most one pillage token, and when a space is marked like this, its terrain type is completely ignored, so you'd adjust the occupying faction's strength if necessary. And pillage tokens are a limited supply, so if you would run out when taking them, just take as many as you can. We're not going to go through each faction's individual abilities in this video, but how they work is explained on the cards, and if you'd like to get a preview, you can pause the screen to read each one to get an idea of how differently they each affect gameplay. You can also refer to these two pages of the rulebook for further details on their abilities if you have questions while playing. Either way, after you resolve the ability on a card you've played, you return it back to the supply. If an ability triggers one or more events to occur, they're resolved in the same way we saw during step one of a turn, but you wait until the card ability is complete and return to the supply, and then you resolve those events. So those are the actions. You can either buy up to three cards, or play a card for its ability, or just skip this step. And then it's time for the third and final step of a turn, drawing a tile. Here, you simply draw a random development tile from the supply and add it to your hand, keeping it secret from the other players, but of course, you can examine your own tiles anytime you want. And if the supply of tiles ever runs out, just skip this step. Once a player has finished the three steps of their turn, the next player in clockwise order takes a turn. Before moving on, though, earlier we explained how you can collect rift tiles, and at any time during your own turn, except during conflicts, which we'll learn about in a moment, the current player can use a rift tile that they have. You simply reveal and resolve its symbol based on the description found on the rift tile player aid. For example, this lets you perform the revive effect and collect up to two lost faction cards for free. After you've resolved the tile, you then return it to the box. Now, we won't go through every effect as how they work is printed on this double-sided card, but pause and read through them if you're curious. With that, we've covered everything in a turn, except for conflicts. So let's go through how those are resolved right now. Remember, a conflict is one of the possible events that might have to be resolved after placing a tile. It will occur if you add a tile to the map in a way that causes two or more occupied territories to connect. And remember, you flip the tile face down while the conflict is being resolved, which is done following a few steps. First, the current player declares which of the two factions involved will be the attacker. In this case, either the orcs or the goblins. If three or more factions were connected by the tile, you still only pick two of the factions to resolve a conflict for first. We'll assume we're dealing with just a two-faction conflict for now, and that we're the current player and have picked the orcs as the attacker. Now remember, no player controls the orcs, or the flares, 
or any faction. What we control is how invested we get in each faction's success. With that in mind, all players at the table now commit any number of cards from their hand to the conflict, putting them face down on the table. The number of cards you commit, which could be zero, is secret, so feel free to cover them with your hand. We'll see why you might commit certain cards in a moment, but cards that match the factions in the conflict will make those factions stronger. You can also commit cards from other factions, which don't do anything, but can act as a bluff. You're also free to collude with the other players at the table and make commitments, but honesty and follow through is not required. Once everyone has finalized their decisions, everyone flips their committed cards, if any, face up on the table for everyone to see. In this case, each player committed a very different number of cards to the conflict. Now starting with the person left of the current player and going clockwise around the table once, each player may play a single card from the one still in their hand for its conflict ability if they want. And you don't make that decision until it's your turn. But if you do decide to use a conflict ability, you then reveal it from your hand. Remember, a conflict ability will have this symbol located on it here. A card with a regular action ability can't be played during this step. That said, you can play a conflict ability even if the related faction isn't in the conflict. After revealing a conflict card during this step, you first gain favor equal to the current spoils value of that faction, which again is found on this row beneath its token. So after playing this flare card, we'd now gain five favor from the supply. And I should mention, if the territory value of a faction is higher than 15, let's just say its territory value was 17, you still leave its token here and use the numbers in this column. Either way, after gaining the related favor, you then resolve the card's ability text. In this case, for every two strength the flare faction currently has on the power track, you can treat a card you committed to the conflict as a different faction. And remember, a faction strength is shown here beneath its token, so in this case we could treat up to three cards as different factions. After resolving the ability, you then send the conflict card you played back to its stack in the supply. And after everyone has had a chance to play a conflict card if they want to, it's then time to determine the winner of the conflict. First, any cards committed to the conflict that don't match the two factions in the conflict are returned to their owner's hands because those were just bluffs. Unless you use that flayer ability that we just saw lets you treat cards as any faction. If I had played a flayer, maybe I'd decide that two of these rat folks I'll treat as orc cards. Then these other three bluffs I'd just take back. Now you compare the strength of each faction in the conflict, which is equal to their strength on the track here, plus one more for every card of their faction players committed to the battle. For example, the orc strength is five, plus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, plus these two that flare caused to be counted as orcs for a total of 14, while the goblin is four, plus one, two, three, four, five, six, for a total of 10. The faction with the higher value is the winner, and in the case of a tie, the attacking faction wins, which the current player had declared at the start of the conflict. Now each player must return to the supply at least half of the cards rounded up that they committed to both sides of the conflict. So this includes both the winning and losing factions, but you calculate each amount separately. For example, I committed six cards to the orc side, so I must lose at least three of these, and I can include these rat folk since I treated them as orcs with my flayer's conflict ability. Since I committed three goblin cards, I must return at least two, and the other players would lose cards in the same way. But remember, you can return more cards from those factions than the amount you're required to, as long as they were committed to the conflict. You can't just discard extra cards from your hand. So perhaps I'll choose to return all three of the goblins I had committed, and we'll see why it might be a good idea to choose to get rid of more cards in a moment. But any cards in the conflict you choose not to get rid of this way, like these three orcs, you'll just put back in your hand. Each card you did return gains you favor equal to the current spoils values of those factions. Now just to make it easy to follow, I've laid out the cards that I returned. And at this point, there's a key rule to keep in mind about the flayer's effect that allowed us to treat these rat folk as orcs. That effect ends at this point, and now we go back to treating them as rat folk, but can still return them to the supply now since they were committed to the conflict. The orcs, for example, have a spoils value of four, 
so I gain a total of four favor for this orc that I'm getting rid of. The rat folk are worth three favor each for a total of six, and the goblins I turned in are worth four favor each for a total of 12, resulting in a grand total of 22 favor. Now you remove the losing faction's camp from the map. If this exposes a rift tile, the current player now collects it. And when the camp marker is removed, that means you also move their faction's strength marker to the lost space. So now it's reduced to having a strength value of one and no spoils value. This is why you might choose to get rid of more faction cards that you'd committed to the conflict than you're required to, because that way you can collect some favor for them before they lose all their value. Now, if we'd begun with a conflict between three or more factions, at this point, the active player would pick two of the remaining factions to battle, declaring one of them as the attacker. And then you resolve that battle. And you'd keep doing this until only one faction remains from the ones whose territories had originally been joined together by that face-down tile. Once all the conflicts have been resolved, flip the tile that initiated the conflict face up. The winning faction's territory now includes all the spaces of this newly connected and expanded territory, so double check for any new terrain that matches their marker and adjust their position on the power track. Also check to see if any lost faction would now fit on any unoccupied territory of the map. If so, the current player establishes that faction's camp there following the usual rules. And that's how conflicts are resolved. And hopefully this gives you some idea of the flow of the game. You'll be establishing camps and growing a faction's territory on the map, while at the same time buying cards in the various factions, which will become more valuable the stronger those factions become. If a faction loses a battle, their value will plummet, but when they come back onto the map, their cards will also be quite cheap, so maybe you'll buy some and try to build up their territory again. Just keep in mind, the number of cards in each stack and the amount of favor each player has is public information. But everything else you keep secret. And turns will continue like this until either the supply of development tiles runs out or the strength tiles of any two factions reach their legendary side. After either of those things happen, that triggers the end of the game. But keep playing until everyone has had an equal number of turns. This means the player seated to the right of the person holding the first player token will always take the final turn of the game. And then it's time for final scoring. Here you total the value of all favor you've collected, which includes any tokens you already have, but then you also gain tokens equal to the strength value of each faction card in your hand. For example, I have five orc cards, and their strength is currently at eight. So that's a total of 40 more favor. And again, notice you earn their strength as favor, not their spoils, as we often did before. If the faction is legendary, like this one is, you earn two more favor for each of their cards that you have. So in that case, I'd earn another two times five or 10 more favor. So that's a total of 50 favor that I'd gain just for the orcs. And of course, I would also check to see if I gain favor for any of the other cards I have in my hand. You also gain three favor for every unused rift tile you have, so in this case, I'd gain six. Now the player with the most favor wins. In the case of a tie, the tied player with the most unused rift tiles wins. And if there's still a tie, the tied players share the victory. The game also comes with rules and components for solo play, but those I'll leave for you to discover on your own. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Dawn of Ulos. If you have any questions at all about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.